I'm going to introduce Chris. So Chris Benda is a botanist and past president of the Illinois Native Plant Society. He currently, he works as a researcher at Southern Illinois University, where he coordinates their, um, the Plants of Concern um, Southern Illinois program, and he teaches the flora of Southern Illinois. Besides working at SIU, he conducts botanical fieldwork around the world, teaches a variety of classes at the Morton Arboretum, and leads nature tours for Camp Odessa. I can't say that. Odessa. <laughs> and um, he um, has research appointments with the University of Illinois and Argonne National Laboratory, and is an accomplished photographer and author of several publications about natural areas in Illinois. He is also known as the Illinois Botanizer, and you can learn a lot by following his Illinois Botanizer Facebook page, visiting his website, and also watching his educational videos on YouTube. And so now I'll give it over to Chris. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to speak to the Greater DuPage Wild Ones about the wild orchids of Illinois. So I am crazy about orchids like a lot of people are, but I'm not that interested in sort of the nursery orchids. I don't have any exotic species of orchid, you know, in my home or as a house plant or anything. I'm, I'm really interested in the native wild orchid flora, particularly of Illinois, but of North America in general. As Wendy said, my name is Chris Benda and I work at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, and this, uh, currently I am coordinator of the Plants of Concern program, which is a partnership between the Chicago Botanic Garden and SIU, in which we uh, work with volunteers to monitor for rare plants. So we're, I've been in the position for just over two years. We've had a number of amazing discoveries and a lot of data gathered. It's really been quite a informative and fruitful endeavor thus far. You can also find me online as Illinois Botanizer. My, my uh, website is appropriately named IllinoisBotanizer.com. I have all the social media checked off. Um, as Wendy mentioned, a number of educational videos are available on my YouTube channel. So check out that content if you want. There's also presentations that I've done for other organizations that are somewhere on YouTube, I'm sure, if you search for my name that I, I don't have associated with my channel. So there's plenty of content from his videos that I've prepared. But also directing you back to my website, I have a plant database where I have uploaded photos that I've been taking of plants in the almost 20 years now of botanizing that I've done in, in the state of Illinois. So I think I have almost 1,100 species represented there. And I've been trying to really focus on getting photos of plants that occur in Illinois that are not commonly found on the internet. And in fact, there's a number of things where if you Google the botanical name, um, my website comes up the first hit because there's not really many or any photos for that particular species. So check that out. But again, the wild orchids of Illinois. So 102 counties in the state. Uh, I've traveled throughout extensively, as you can imagine. Uh, some of these orchids are quite rare in their distribution. So you really need to travel to all corners of Illinois in order to seek out and find and photograph and observe. Uh, all our native orchids. So a little background about orchids before I get into the talk. Um, this is the largest family of plants, um, among the largest family of plants, sorry, one of the top five. Uh, most of the diversity is in the tropics, which isn't too surprising. I think most people, you know, the, the word orchid sort of brings up exotic with it, and that's where the tropics are, essentially. Um, but I think most people are surprised to learn that there are so many native species in whatever state they live in, particularly in the Midwest. So I will cover the data here in a little bit, but there's over 50 uh, in the state of Illinois. Most importantly here is if you look at the picture on the left, I'm holding a capsule. So a capsule is a type of fruit in which there are many seeds inside. And all those little like sort of dust-like hairs that's an individual seed for this orchid. So orchids produce a lot of seed. 
and they're very tiny, which means that they are windborne. They can travel very extensively in the wind, this little tiny particle. But of course, and that's good, right? The plant wants to reproduce and to spread uh, the seed far and wide. But the problem with having such a small seed is that there's no endosperm included, which is basically the, the food or the nutrients that the plant has to live on until it's large enough to make food on its own. It has to have some energy stored. And with a tiny little seed, there really isn't much energy. So that's the whole crux of the, of the equation here when it comes to orchid ecology is that the seed needs to land on soil that contains mycorrhizal fungi. So little mushrooms essentially. Um, and they connect to the mushrooms and the mushrooms are basically feeding them nutrients and water and things um, while they're growing. And then once they uh, reach maturity, you know, if they're green, then they uh, photosynthesize on their own. But of course, we have a number of non-green orchids as well. So the mycorrhizal fungi association is really the, the key scenario. And it's not, it's not ubiquitous. It's, it's not everywhere. Or we would have orchids being much more common because they make so much seed. So it's really the the key of landing in a location um, where this attachment can be made to the soil fungi. The flowers are bilaterally symmetrical, which means that you can cut them in half in only one way and get two equal halves. Um, and that the fancy term for that is zygomorphic versus actinomorphic, which is radially symmetrical, which would be um, like a pizza pie. You could cut it in any direction and get two equal halves. Uh, also, a lot of the orchid flowers are resupinate which is a term that basically means upside down. So orchids are interesting in that there's three petals, but one of the petals is um, adapted into a lip, the, uh, <clears throat> the labellum. And the lip should be on the, on the top. So often a lot of orchid flowers, as they emerge and open, they twist so that the lip is actually on the bottom which would be upside down. And that's what resupinate re refers to. So if they're not twisted, they would be non-resupinate. So not this isn't specific to orchids, but orchids uh, flowers do this frequently. Another thing I'll mention later is that some of them are photos, winter photosynthesizing. Um, and, and other ones are non-green, which means they can't photosynthesize. They have to steal food, nutrients from uh, other organisms. We used to consider them to be saprophytic. A lot of the old guidebooks talk about um, the saprophytic nature of some orchids, but new understanding is that they're mycoheterotrophic, which basically means that they're attaching to fungi. They're parasitic on, on soil fungi and, and saprophytic meaning living off of organic matter. So a little difference there in the parasitic, uh, parasitic mechanism. And then lastly, uh, a lot of orchids are epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that are growing on other plants. So particularly in Florida and the tropics, we have a lot of orchids that grow on trees, high up on trees, and they makes them challenging to find and to study. Um, in Illinois, um, we don't have any epiphytic orchids, but generally speaking, a lot of them are. And as I mentioned, this is a very large family. I think Columbia uh, has the largest diversity of orchids with something like 4,000 species. Um, someone in S at SAU actually did her PhD on the orchids of Columbia, and it's really fascinating stuff. All right, moving on, here's some literature that you may want to be aware of. The first publication was this one here, The Wild Orchids of Illinois, Glenn um, Winterringer, who was at the Illinois State Museum, put this together. Excellent publication. Let's see if I quickly look at the date. Um, I guess I don't see it, but it's it's in early. It's probably 1950s. Oh, it says on there. I'm sorry, 1967. Then we also have introduction to the ecology of the Orchidaceae book, which is Charles Shibiak, 1974. And he actually did a, this is an excellent compendium of all the specimens that have been collected for all of orchids in Illinois. So he's got all these um, herbarium collections mentioned and dot maps and distribution, and, and uh, he actually split out a number of orchids and sort of clarified um, the, the taxonomy based on Illinois. So that is the best book. And then the vascular flora of Illinois has all the plants that occur in the wild in Illinois, including the orchids. And then I had the link there at the bottom for Dan Nickrent was, um, he's Professor Emeritus at the Plant Biology Department at SIU, and he has a website on orchids as well. So these are the sources I used for this talk. 
I'll mention that on the distribution maps for the orchids, in parentheses, there is a number between 0 and 10. That number is the coefficient of conservatism. And as the definition here says, basically native plants that are most successful in badly damaged habitats are not conservative. They have a C value close to zero versus plants that are restricted to natural areas, which are pristine, intact, remnant natural communities. They are conservative species and they get a C value of 10. And there is extensive uh, publication on this in the Aeroginia Journal, which is the journal of the Illinois Native Plant Society and on their website which is now uh, IllinoisPlants.org, you can find all the back issues for aerogenia, including number 15, that has all the coefficients of conservatism for all species of plants in Illinois. So as you can imagine, orchids, um, they generally occur in pristine habitats. And that's one reason why they're rare is that we have changed the landscape so drastically uh, around the world and in North America, and especially in Illinois. So a lot of the orchids have a C value of 10, meaning that they only occur in pristine, intact, remnant natural communities. So uh, this presentation basically is arranged alphabetically, and I'm going to go through all the orchids that were ever recorded to occur in Illinois. And this includes um, 54 taxa. So I use taxa instead of species because this includes some varieties. So there are several species that have multiple varieties, and therefore we use the word taxa to describe them together. Uh, so 54 is the total number. Um, two of them are in somewhat in dispute. Um, I honestly forget the particulars there, but um, you know there are records, but no specimen can be found, and you know the person you know may have a personal observation or some literature that mentions it, but without a physical specimen to verify, um, sometimes the occurrence can be in doubt. And then there's a couple hybrid species as well. So I was working, if you look at just uh, species only and now the, not the, the varieties, there's 50 in that have ever occurred in Illinois. Unfortunately, 11 are extirpated. And extirpated means locally extinct. So not extinct in the wild in, in on earth, but in Illinois, they used to occur and they no longer occur, 11 species. And that's because we have drastically altered the landscape and have not allowed for many pristine areas to persist where these orchids used to occur. Uh, there is one orchid that is non-native. That's interesting. Um, so that leaves us with 38 extant, meaning present, currently present native species of orchid. And then I'll mention that I have not seen all the orchids in Illinois, particularly the ones that no longer occur in Illinois. I'd have to obviously travel to another state to get those photos, and I have not done that for all of them yet. So I want to acknowledge uh, three photographers in addition to myself that contributed photos for this presentation. Uh, Andrew Lane Gibson is a botanist in Ohio, and Jim Fowler is a terrific uh, orchid photographer and author of several publications. Fortunately, he passed away one or two years ago um, photographing orchids, doing what he loved. So that was tragic, um, but he previously allowed me to use photos um, for the presentation. Then my dear friend, Rachel Goad, who was also formerly of the Chicago Botanic Garden and SIU, uh, contributed photos as well. So I'm a photographer myself. I find it very important when anybody graciously allows you to use their work that they get acknowledged. Now, before I get into the nitty gritty here, a little word on poaching, because I think I'm preaching to the choir here. People wouldn't uh, do that on this, uh, who are involved with this group, but just to clarify, poaching is illegal, it's unethical, and it won't work. Because of this orchid association with the mycorrhizal soil fungi, if you dig up an orchid and move it somewhere else, very rarely will it survive. So therefore, uh, make sure when it comes to orchids in the wild that you leave them be, or if you're, if you're with other people, you know, teach them, spread the word, that we want our orchids to remain in the wild and not dug up and moved, because that is one of the reasons why many of them are rare. Okay, so let's start here with the A's. Uh, Aplectrum hymali is the putty root orchid. That's the species that is on the left. And I'm showing it here with Tipularia discolor, the cranefly orchid, because these are both winter photosynthesizing orchids. So they primarily occur in the southern part of the state. 
and they actually grow their leaf. E each plant produces a single green leaf in November, and they emerge in November, and they photosynthesize through the winter, and they wither away in the spring. And what's interesting is then typically when the flowers bloom, you don't Sometimes you can see a little remnant of a leaf, but you don't see the nice full green broad leaf that you do in the wintertime. So the, they're sort of like wild leeks, you know, in that regard that they, they, they flower and have leaves at totally different times of the year. And as you can imagine, you know, it, it's an interesting strategy in, in far south, we don't get a lot of snow. So you don't have to worry about being, a, you know, having your leaf covered by, by snowfall. Um, there are no leaves on the trees, so there's a lot of unimpeded sunlight that reaches the, the forest floor in the wintertime. Of course, the days are short, so you're you're kind of limited on sunlight during the day some to some degree, but um, it's just another strategy to take advantage of a niche that no other you know other plants aren't using. So I will come back to the crane fly orchid when we get to the end of the show, but this one here is uh, the putty root, which is also called the Adam and Eve orchid. You see the distribution here. It's actually quite a bit through Illinois and even farther north. So as you can imagine, in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and areas, uh, it would have some trouble photosynthesizing in the winter. Snowfall is, is heavy. I just drove through Wisconsin yesterday, and except for the far northern counties, um, there wasn't much snow. So at least this year, they're doing okay. Now let's move on to uh, Arethusa bulbosa is the dragonmouth orchid. I've never seen this orchid in the wild. Unfortunately, in Illinois, it is one of the extirpated species. Uh, there are records of it in Chicagoland, where it's there's a lot of bogs. It, it likes boggy, swampy habitat, acidic conditions. And, you know, a lot of the bogs in, in northern Illinois have been drained and filled and developed. So the habitat has been, they were probably weren't very common at all in, in the collections that are um, the, the specimens that have been collected were done very long ago in the 19, early 1900s and even 1800s. So that one probably isn't being around for a while, but it is a beauty. And you can see the range here. Um, these maps are from BONAP, which is the um, Biota of North America program. And you can see here they have mapped Cook County. If we look at these maps also, we can see that anything in light green in, indicates a county in which there is a specimen for this species. Uh, if it's in, and it's common, or at least uh, common to uncommon, versus uh, yellow means it's rare in that state, typically state endangered or threatened. And then the orange would mean extirpated, that they're no longer occurring. So the Cook County one in this map should, should really be orange because uh, it is extirpated. Now moving on, we have the grass pink orchids, Calipogon. And this one here is Calipogon pocellus. Pocellus means showy. I think that's a, a good... Uh, species epithet for this one. Um, it is Illinois endangered. It, it occurs in around Chicago land. It likes calcareous fens. So calcareous, it means alkaline or basic on the pH scale. Um, and this one, I, I actually am not sure if I agree with the endangered status here. When I did my graduate research in Lake County, um, I saw this orchid a number of times. It, it is definitely conservative, uh, which is relegated to high quality areas, but there, there's a number of locations for it. But the interesting thing is that I think if, if this plant is not blooming, it basically looks like a blade of grass. It has a single leaf. It's very narrow and small and, and just like a blade of grass. And then of course, when they bloom, this exquisite flower comes out and emerges. So if this was a, a sedge or a grass or something, I really doubt that it would be endangered in Illinois. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a rare species, and it's one that is, excuse me, non-resupinate. So we can see the labellum, the lip petal, um, is on the top, and that's what, what would be sort of the normal orientation, uh, the right side up. But it is an exquisite beauty. We can see the range there. The problem with some of these range maps is that some of the green counties may represent collections uh, for areas that are no longer existing. So like you can see for this species here, way down in, I actually have it for Jackson County, Illinois, which is the county that I reside in. Um, it's it's green and, and certainly that should be orange because there have not been seen. I think that site is destroyed, but in any event, this does give us some idea um, as to the local distribution. And you can definitely see it kind of like the coast goes around the Great Lakes and the Atlantic states down to the Southeast. 
Now, it is similar to Calipogon oklahomensis, which actually wasn't even described uh, as new to science. Gosh, I think it was in the late 1980s, maybe early 1990s. So this was lumped in with Pukelis, basically, and um, uh, Bill Summers in Missouri did work with this, this orchid, and, and actually a lot of it occurs in Oklahoma, hence, hence the name. Um, but in Illinois, it actually only occurs in one state. So there are a number um, in uh, one county, which is um, Will County. So there are a number of differences, although it, they're subtly similar. Um, let me bring up this. Well, first of all, let's look at the distribution map for the Oklahoma grass pink. As you can see, mostly in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and just scattered localities otherwise. But we don't know how many of previous sites um, that Calipogon pokellus was recorded from, in which there's no specimen and the site is no longer intact, it could have been Oklahomensis. There's no way to go back and verify the site is gone. There was no specimen. So we have to just fill in the gaps here the best we can for that. But it does occur in Minnesota. And so um, Peter Duziak here asked me to contribute photos for their website. And you can see them side by side on the Minnesota Wildflowers page. So notice that the labellum there, the lip petal, it's got a different shape. It's really more, I would say, diamond shape on the left in the Oklahomensis versus a triangle shape for Pokellus or tuberosis was a, is a synonym. Um, you can see the differences in, in where the hairs are located and some of the colors. Another thing that I've noticed is um, the flowers on Oklahomensis tend to bloom at the same time. Um, they're a little more staggered for tuberosis. And there's um, the link, the leaf, if the leaf is as long as the flower versus um, longer than. So those are all differences there that help it distinguish between these two similar and very beautiful uh, orchids in Illinois. The, the Calipoga and Oklahomensis, I went to that site in 2013. I'd never seen this plant before. It was ex in perfect bloom. I've returned many times in the 10 years since, and I've never seen it again there. But it does turn up at a few other places um, in Will County every year. So we know that it's extant, but at the site I saw that one at, um, it had not reappeared. Now uh, we have the green bracted orchid, Coeloglossum viridi, which is um, also quite rare in the state. It's not listed as, as endangered or threatened, but it may become, once we do a, a better review, it is uh, added to the watch list, which is, isn't a real thing yet necessarily, but um, we're working, botanists are working on developing a watch list, which means it's not threatened or endangered, but it still should be paid attention to. And, and actually, as we track it, which that's the main thing, it, it allows people to pay attention to it and return in reports, and we may learn that it's more common than thought or or that it's actually is rare and should be listed. So this is uh, one of two extant orchids in Illinois that I have never seen or photographed. So that's high on my list, but it primarily occurs in the northwest part of the state still. It, there, there are distributions throughout Illinois, um, but it, it is uh, not very commonly found. And, and as you can look at it, it's, it's all green. I mean, it really blends in well. So besides being rare, you really have to have a good search image to seek out and find the, the Coeloglossum viridi, which has a few other synonyms as well. <clears throat> we see the distribution here. I know there's still some, I think, hanging on in the Vermilion Champaign County areas that you see the large circle, uh, large squares there on the Illinois County map, but mostly in the northern state, in northern counties, and particularly the northwest. So I was invited recently, um, or was recently asked if I wanted to join on surveys for this this year, and of course I do, I want to see it, I want to photograph it, so hopefully I will be able to do that this year. Moving on, actually, is the second of the two native extant orchids in Illinois that I've never seen or photographed, the Coloriza maculata. So this is one of the coral root orchids. And the coral root orchids are non-green, which means they cannot photosynthesize. They are parasitic, living off of soil fungi. But you can see they do produce beautiful flowers. This is a uh, rare Illinois endangered and one that also I'll have to be seeking out soon to get my own photographs of and make sure I have observed it in the state. We can see the distribution there. It's kind of uh, strange that it's so common out west and so common out in the northeast, but 
not so much in between and and not in the Great Plains area, which of course includes most of Illinois. So there are some extant populations up in Chicagoland and older records as well. There are a few coloriza in Illinois. This one's much more common, Coloriza odontoriza, which is the fall coral root orchid. Um, I do have these arranged alphabetically. So this one here um, is also, let me look here, statewide, let me go back to the picture. It's also um, parasitic, non-green. Often actually the flowers are cleistogamous, which means that they don't really open, they're self-fertilizing. So they're clones, they're making seed asexually, which means you don't really need a flower if it's not really getting pollinated, selfing. Um, so they have these cleistogamous flowers, which means they're not particularly showy and they're small little short plants, but they can often uh, occur in some abundance. And I find that they really like to grow in pine stands in Southern Illinois, which the pine stand, the pine areas in Southern Illinois are not native areas. They are plantations. And there's a whole explanation for why, you know, so much pine has been planted in Illinois. Um, but this one, you know, a lot of orchids do like the acidic uh, soils, and that's often what's present under pine trees. So I found that if you're going through, particularly in Pope County, Shawnee National Forest and a pine plantation, and you look carefully, it shouldn't be too hard to find uh, the fall coral root orchid. You see then again, distribution, it's pretty common in Southern Illinois. Like I said, it's hard to see. You got to look closely and, and they're, you know, they don't bloom for very long or are present. So it's hard to observe particularly, but it does occur throughout the state. Now, here's another one that I have not seen in Illinois because, oh, it's also been extirpated. So there are a few records of this in Chicagoland, um, but they're no longer there. But you can see Jim Fowler's excellent photo of a, a mass bloom of them, presumably somewhere in the southeast. And we can see here the range map has it mapped in Cook County. Um, where, you know, Cook County, that's Chicago. So there is a lot of, um, I should say, relatively speaking, a lot of high quality pristine habitat in Cook County and in Chicago land, but they're very small and they're, you know, um, nestled in between massive amounts of development. So a lot of these orchids were probably more widespread and, and weren't able to persist in the um, heavily altered landscape of Chicago region. But here's the, the, the fourth coloriza we have that is extant in Illinois. Coloriza wisteriana is the spring cor coral root orchid, which I would say is um, also uncommon, but again, hard to see. Um, they wither up very quickly, so you have to be out at the right place at the right time to observe them. But I, I'm out a lot throughout the growing season, and you know I'm looking at all the plants that I encounter in my path, and I find that I can typically find this, just randomly encounter it every year without having to visit specific sites that I know it occurs at. So it's common enough um, in that regard. And it also will produce the cleistogamous flowers that don't always fully open. But we can see the range there pretty much just in the southern part of Illinois and the southern part of the United States. I see value seven. Now, here we have Cypripedium acaulei, the first of many in the series of, yellow, of uh, lady slipper orchids. This is the pink lady slipper, which is not particularly conservative in states around Illinois, um, although it was always in high quality habitats within Illinois. Unfortunately, as far as my research has determined, this is also extirpated. There was not a lot of it in the state originally, um, and it has not been seen in decades. So it could still be lurking out there somewhere and it hasn't been found, um, but as far as the places where it used to occur, um, it's no longer extant. And, and it's probably having to do with um, different nuances with the site changing with hydrology and, and uh, um, other impacts. But here we see it's you know, very common out in the Southeast and, and actually easy to find in Kentucky and Tennessee, um, particularly North, in Wisconsin, I know I've seen it many times. Um, and actually, the Indiana Dunes is, is, is one there in the box. I got an exquisite photo of it there um, last year. But in Illinois, just a few counties. In fact, I, I think it might still be lurking around in uh, Ogle County. So later this year, I'm going to try to see if I can get a chance to poke around for it. Because I do travel to Ogle County quite a bit. It is a wonderful place uh, in Illinois. Now, here's one of the hybrids. So Cypripedium andrusii is a hybrid between the white lady slipper and the small yellow. Uh, but that's not one that I've seen. You see Rachel Goad's 
um, attribution there. It does grow in the wet prairies around Chicago land, and, and it has sort of you know intermediate um, morphology between the the white and the yellow. But we can see the range there. Not a very common hybrid, but uh, in a few counties in the Midwest. And then this one here, there's is one of the ones in dispute, I believe. Cypripedium. Um, can't see the label. I forget the name, but it's the Ram's Head Orchid. Uh, this picture was in Wisconsin, which is a good place to go see these. If you're if you're unaware, Door County, Illinois, or Door County, Wisconsin, I have not been there. Unfortunately, yeah, but a lot of people have told me how uh, it's a great place to see lady slipper orchids. Um, and for that matter, so is uh, Canada, Newfoundland, the Bruce Peninsula up in Canada is supposed to be phenomenal. So there are really places outside of Illinois we can go see um, a lot of different uh, native orchids in great abundance too. So that's that's really, really uh, pretty wild. But uh, so he doesn't have Illinois mapped here. Again, I forget the particulars, but there was a report somewhere. It's a little unclear. So I have it in the disputed category, but you can see much more common to the north. And <laughs> excuse me. And then these exquisite beauties, the Cypripedium candidum is the white lady slipper orchid. They are very small. It's hard to appreciate how adorable they are until you see them in person and really see how, how tiny they are. They are a pretty much a wet prairie uh, fen plant. And it used to be an Illinois listed species. And it was actually delisted because they were able to conserve this plant at a, a number of protected nature preserves. And so the idea is that enough populations exist in protected places that it is not really rare anymore and deserving of listing as threatened or endangered. But they are still always exquisite to find and not too hard to find in Chicago region if you know where to look. So we see the range there. Lots of old records throughout so more southern parts of the state. But um, if you want to see this one, it's really best to be in um, in one of the Chicago land counties. Now, there are three yellow lady slipper orchids. There's the moccasin variety here, which is the, the really rare one. Um, variety uh, parvoflorum is this one here. And then the most common, the variety pubescens. So if I go back to variety parvoflorum, it's very similar to variety pubescens, but as the name parvoflorum uh, translates, it, it has a small flower. Also, the sepals are more maroon color and they have fewer leaves per stem. The pubescence can vary. There are, there are a number of differences, but they are quite variable, um, particularly the large yellow lady slipper variety pubescens has so much variability that I personally have not been able to really parse out um, the parvoflorum variety, although it's supposed to occur in Southern Illinois as well. I've found ones that have smaller flowers, but um, this the large one can have quite a range in its flower size and it overlaps. So these are ones I have a little more work to do and a friend suggested to me to, to go up to Newfoundland where you can see lots of the variety parvoflorum and, and, um, and they look quite different up there. But these are one of the most common species of Eastern North America been drastically reduced due to poaching um, by humans, um, loss of habitat, deer predation, and all those things. So it's always fun to find the yellow lady slipper orchid, but I mean, it's in almost every county in Illinois, certainly over half the counties have at least a collection has been made. So it's one that is widespread, even though um, still kind of hard to find. Now, this one here, Cypripedium regini, is the, the showy lady slipper orchid, which is the um, state flower of Minnesota, which is my home state. I've never seen them in Minnesota, though. And in fact, I've never seen them in Illinois either. In fact, I had them on my extirpated list, but uh, some friends of mine found a population or revisited one in Lake County last year. So they are still extant in Illinois. I got these pictures in Missouri where they're a little more common. But it is just an absolutely beautifully showy wildflower, and I, I wish we had more of it in the state. There was a, a site a lot of people knew about near Peoria that had a bunch of them, and basically um, it was flooded out. You know, it was a it was a wetland, it's sort of like a fen sort of site, and it's just now it's kind of like a lake. So they they no longer occur there, but they do occur in Lake County still, and perhaps elsewhere. You see the distribution here. We're kind of at the southern edge of the range. Very common in Minnesota, like I said, where it's the state flower. 
Moving on here, this is the non-native one here, Epipactus helleborini, um, which is actually pretty widespread uh, in Chicagoland and, and actually beyond. It seems like it's moving its way south. I have a number of times I've seen people uh, observe these in their garden. Um, they're, they're moving, you know, see dust-like seeds. They move around quite extensively and they can, can really come up a lot in people's landscaping. But I think I took these pictures at Deer Grove in uh, Cook County. So you can see them out in the wild in nature preserves and such. Um, it's not really problematic necessarily, but it is a non-native species that you see kind of throughout uh, or in many states in the United States. We also have the showy orcas. And yes, the term is orcas. I don't not exactly sure why they use that word. It's not a typo, but the showy orcas um, here is also just two leaves at the base of the plant beautiful with the purple and white flowers. Um, it's really conservative as well. And I've been to a number of sites in Southern Illinois where there's a lot of it, but typically this is hard to find. And if you're in anywhere else in Illinois and you find this, even just one in your woods, I mean, you should be elated because it is, uh, it's one that seems like it doesn't always come back. These are perennial species. So the roots, you know, occur multiple years, but orchids are picky about when they bloom. They don't always bloom in the same location year after year. So um, they're somewhat ephemeral in that nature, and, and that makes it so much more rewarding than when you are able to observe them. And we see the range there, I mean, in almost every county in Illinois, but not frequently encountered, the Galliaris. We also have Gallier pubescens, which is uh, rare in parts of its range in Illinois and Southern Illinois, pretty common, have been a lot of sites that um, have it. It, they also have, so these photosynthesize in the winter, but they're actually evergreen. So the leaves are present year round and they have this uh, distinct patterning to them that sort of resembles a you know rattlesnake pattern, which is one reason for the name. It was also uh, thought to be used uh, effectively to treat rattlesnake bites, which is not a cure, um, but it is a beautiful orchid. In fact, you see the basil rosettes often in the woods. They're, they're, they stand out pretty well. And like I said, they're evident in the wintertime, but they don't always make a bloom. Like I said, they're perennials, but they have to have the right conditions in order to send up a blooming stalk that you can see there in the picture on the right. And the distribution there, when I was up in uh, Castle Rock last year, we saw lots of this, but generally they're rare in most of Illinois, except in the Southern part of the state, extreme Southern counties where it's not too hard to find in the woods. Then this spectacular beauty, Hexelectra spicata. This is another non-green one. So, so I thought really rare, and I've actually been able to visit every known location for this species in Illinois, and I have 22 subpopulations in five counties. So that, that doesn't scream super rare to me by any means. And we find typically about 500 a year, but they are really beautiful um, orchids and they can get quite tall, you know, foot and a half tall maybe. So they're fun to monitor for, but they grow in late July is the best time to find them. And they grow often around hill prairies and limestone glades. So it's open, you know, they're up, uh, up high on the bluff, it's open and hot and dry, so miserable conditions to be outside, but, you know, you get a little burst of uh, enthusiasm when you find one. And we see the range there. We actually have four new subpopulations for this species in Illinois in the last two years, so that's been really exciting. Then we have Isotria. The two Isotrias in Illinois are pretty rare. This is uh, Medelioloides, and that's the small Pagonia orchid. This was actually found at one site in Randolph County. Uh, Julius Swain actually bought the, the, the woodland and him and Mike Hamoya, Hamoya who is the Indiana, previous Illinois state, uh, previous Indiana state botanist, Mike Hamoya, they found this there in Randolph County and John, John Schwegman, who was the Illinois state botanist, for many years monitored this and he hypothesizes that the last plants were dug up by chipmunks. But there is actually a publication in the Illinois Native Plant Society Journal, Aerogenia, where John talks about the monitoring for this orchid over his career. And it's been over 25 years since it's been seen. Uh, I'm going to try to go look for it and, you know, anyway this year. And, and we did last year as well. So it's sort of the needle in the, ho needle in the ho haystack find. But we remain hopeful um, that it will turn up again someday because it is extirpated. But it is actually... Um, federally threatened. So it's rare throughout its range, but if you really want to find good populations, I think you got to go down to Georgia. 
versus Isotria verticillata is the large pagonia orchid. And these are extant. It actually is just down in Polk County. Um, one site, actually, John Schwegman took me to see these in uh, was it April 15th, 2012, I remember. So warm year, 2012 was a really warm winter. So they were maybe blooming a little bit earlier, but um, I've never seen them bloom again in Illinois. I often find plants. We actually found a new subpopulation uh, two years ago. So there's two sites with this and um, haven't seen blooms in 10 years. So that's kind of interesting for this one. But uh, it is more common out to, you know, the south and to the east, which just, again, just Pope County and Illinois extant populations. Uh, Liparis lilifolia, Liparis liliafolia is the tway blade orchid you can see here, which is really weird looking flowers. I remember the first time I saw this plant and I thought, what in the world is that? And it was actually in Lake County, Forest Preserve in Lake County. Uh, but this is probably the most widespread, most... Uh, you know, spe weed weedy, if I can say. Some people even do call this a weedy orchid. It grows in disturbed places, and it's not really that hard to find um, throughout the state, particularly in, in the south. And you see all the counties marked with this distribution. The one here that's harder to find is the Liparis lacellii, this lesser tway blade. I just have this one photo uh, of this plant. I've only, I've actually seen it a few times, but the other times I've seen it were not photo worthy. This is the only one I've seen that didn't bloom um, in Illinois, and it's not really easy to encounter. And you see the range mostly just in the north part of the state. And then we have these um, Malaxis orchids. So extirpated, you know, these are really rare in Illinois. And so I don't know photos of those. You see formerly in one county for that species. And then the Unifolia, I have seen in Missouri, but not Illinois. This one could still be around, but as far as we know, it's determined to be extirpated. You see just um, a handful of counties for Illinois distribution as well. So those may still be lurking out there somewhere, but haven't been seen in some time. And then I'm trying to speed up here a little bit because we're getting close to time, but they have the Platanthera orchids. And they used to be in the Habanaria genus. This one, Aquilonis, is um, pretty uncommon. I've only seen it one time, but common enough that it's not listed. But it's a species that grows in fens and open places. You can see the range there. There's a few counties in, in the northeast part of the state. Then this one here is truly wild. Um, have it here in the book. The Platanthera Laflora glottis. So this one, it says, the Macon County record is truly remarkable. And the Macon County Station must remain an enigma, is what Charles Sheviak says, because we look at the range here, not, it's, it hasn't ever been seen. There's one collection that is in the, from the wild in Illinois, again, from Macon County in the center of the state. It's not a prairie orchid. Um, it's a, quite a bit removed from the nearest population, even though it is in southern Michigan. Um, and there was there is old records for Cook, Cook County as well, but the the one there is just outside of Decatur. Really bizarre that it was there, but somebody collected one, and we have the physical specimen exists um, for that. So really bizarre that that was found in the state, but so long ago it's no longer there. Uh, but this one is still extant. We actually have only uh, two locations in Illinois for what they call the yellow fringed orchid or orange fringed orchid, Platanthera ciliaris. Oh, absolutely exquisitely beautiful. I've seen them at both locations, and at one of them, um, there are typically hundreds of plants that bloom, so they're cool to see. But up in uh, basically Cook County, Kankakee County, they have their map for those. Then we have the Platanthera clavellata, which is an interesting one because not only is it rare in Illinois, it occurs in northern Illinois and southern Illinois. We have, I think, three subpopulations in extreme southern Illinois where it grows in seep springs, but in uh, the northern part of the state, um, it's very rare as well. And typically there's just kind of one leaf or maybe two, two leaves on the stem. So not very leafy and small little flowers and the club spur orchid, which you can see the range there. Then uh, Dilatata, Platanthera Dilatata. I took this picture in Wisconsin. It is also extirpated in Illinois. It's a very fragrant one. Of course, you know, vanilla is an orchid or plant vanilla, so some of them have a vanilla type scent to them. I didn't get a strong smell out of it, but you can see um, my colleague here um, 
Andy was smelling them on the sedge tour we did. And then Platanthera flava, variety flava, is one that is in Southern Illinois. And I also have tracked all the subpopulations the last two years. Swamps, so with cypress trees and, and other Southern affinity species. And I have to tell you, it doesn't seem like it's that rare. There's only two or three counties where it occurs and maybe 10 subpopulations, but there were thousands at some of them. I mean, literally 5,000 plants we counted in just a dense patch. I mean, it was really phenomenal and taxing. I, I admitted at the end of the survey, I thought I never want to see this orchid again after flagging thousands of them in an afternoon. Um, I've had enough of it, but <laughs> it, is, uh, it is an extant species in Illinois. And a little different than its cousin here, the Plantanthera flava variety, Urbiola, which is in the northern part of the state. So Urbiola is in the north variety, flavors in the south, uh, but they are somewhat similar species. You see the range there. The range map's messed up because it's based not on the varieties, but on just the Plantanthera flavor itself. So it kind of has both of them in the same map. But let's move on. Plantanthera um, hookeri. There's another one that's extirpated in Illinois. I have not seen that one here or anywhere else. Um, very limited in its distribution long ago. Collections remained, habitats destroyed, no longer present. But we can see there was, you know, around Chicagoland, again, Lake County, Cook County, and then single county there in on the western edge of the state. But this one is also one of our more uh, common sort of weedier ones. It grows in a variety of habitats. Um, it grows at the sewage lagoon near campus, so my friends call it the poo pond orchid, which is kind of funny. Uh, I saw it at Illinois Beach State Park, where I took these photos in 2004, uh, but Potanthera lacera is the ragged fringed or green fringed orchid, which is a neat one there. You see the range, it does occur statewide. Somewhat similar to the federally threatened Platanthera leucophea, which is the eastern prairie fringed orchid. We call it EPFO. And this one, because it's federally threatened, has had a lot of work done on monitoring and recovery. And Illinois is the stronghold for this. There are now lots of large viable populations of this orchid that has actually been introduced to a number of sites with appropriate habitat. But because the pollination uh, dynamics are, are tricky and, and somewhat unknown, often volunteers use toothpicks to move which are called polymnia, or pollen sacs, basically, between populations in order to uh, enhance their viability and get, you know, reproduction. So this is one that was much, very common in Illinois, in the prairies and such, wet prairies particularly, um, and had been greatly reduced in number and is actually growing again due to recovery efforts, mainly by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But we can see the range there, mostly, again, in Illinois, a few states around. And these photos of mine for this species are used on the North American uh, Orchid Conservation Center page. The Smithsonian has a Go Orchids site, and they use a number of my photos for that. But let's move on. Here's uh, Platanthera orbiculata, another one that's been extirpated in Illinois. You see there just a few counties long ago it was known in that area. Then we have Platanthera paramina, which actually is common. It's only in the southern half of the state. It's got neat looking uh, um, petals there that you can see. The, the flowers there looks sort of like a, almost like fangs on a snake. But it, it grows on roadsides and wet places. It's not really that hard to find. Again, pretty much restricted to the southern half of the state. That's the fringe list, purple fringe list orchid versus the purple fringed orchid. Very rare in Illinois, only in Cook and Lake counties. And I've seen a number of just spectacularly beautiful individuals like these two in these photos. Um, quite the, 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 the petals are quite fringed, hence the name, the fringed orchid. But there are also one of the sites I found white forms, which I later read was very rare. I mean, these wildflowers are rare in Illinois, but not necessarily in other states, but the white ones are rare anywhere. And I happened to see one um, at one of the sites years ago. So you see the range there on that. And then we have the um, snake mouth orchid. This is a Pagonia, Ophioglossoides. Also Illinois endangered, quite rare. It grows in bogs. 
can actually see, I think, like marsh fern and the marsh sink foil or behind the plant there on the on the right side of the photo. So not commonly encountered, pretty small little orchid as well. You can see there just around Chicagoland for the most part, bog habitat. So we're getting into the, the last group here, near the last group, the Spiranthes are the ladies' tresses orchids. So there are a number of one. This is Cyranthes cernua, which is cernua means nodding, and it's called nodding ladies' tresses orchid. This was basically the, the common statewide orchid um, for a long time, and there has been a lot of uh, systemics work, systematics work with uh, Spiranthes genus, which is interesting. Almost all, I mean, pretty much all the orchids in Illinois, with the exception maybe of the, the yellow lady slipper varieties that I was uh, explaining, are easily distinguishable. They don't look like anything else except the Spiranthes genus. There are, a, they, a lot of them look really similar, but um, some taxonomy work has been done recently and determined that most of the Cernua populations are actually in Spiranthes incurva, particularly in the north, but in the south, we can have them both. So I haven't really teased out all the nuances of the identification. Like I said, a lot of them look very similar. So we, a lot of things were lumped in Spiranthes Cernua that have now been split out. That's why you see this is massive range for it. So we're, we're trying to better clarify uh, the different species that are in this complex and their distributions. Uh, one that's a little bit um, easier to identify is the Spiranthes uh, gracilis, the slender lady slippers orchid. You can see, or uh, slender ladies tresses, you can see how they have the spiraling nature often. If you look at the key, it talks about how many rows of spiraling flowers, and some of them just have a single row of flowers in a spiral like this one. And they're really quite neat to see. I think I'm pretty sure I saw this at Illinois Beach State Park years ago. Um, but it's similar to uh, Spiranthes lacera, which is really more in the southern part of the state. They're actually they were lumped together for a while. Different authorities have them together. Some of them have them split out. Um, but I just took this picture at uh, Ferncliff State Park uh, last September, I believe. These the, the Spiranthes orchids typically bloom late in the year in the fall and such. Uh, but one that is rare and then only the northern part of the state is the Spiranthes uh, lucida, uh, shining ladies, tresses orchids, lucida means shining. And this one actually blooms in sort of the early summertime. So it's it's uh, earlier than a lot of the, the other Spiranthes. And the photo I have of it is on the left, which isn't very good, but it was in Cook County. So I added uh, one from Andrew Lane Gibson that shows the, the yellow throat that helps identify this particular orchid. So we see the range there, Illinois endangered only in the Northeast. And then Spiranthes magnicamporum is the basically the prairie lady tresses orchid. Very somewhat similar to Cernua as well, but um, it has some subtle differences. And one of the things is it's very fragrant. And actually I, I notice that you really don't have to get that close. You can kind of be in the vicinity and, and smell the, the light vanilla scent in this orchid. So that's kind of an interesting thing to use your nose to identify plants. Um, but it is on hill prairies and, and other prairies, mainly in the northern part of the state, the Magna Camporum. Again, these species, a lot of them are very similar, and I don't have yet a super clear understanding of all the differences. Um, but this one here is a little bit easier because it's so much smaller, Spiranthes ovalis. And you can see how tiny the flowers are. That helps for identification. Also, you can look and see if there are any leaves on the stem during flowering. That's another characteristic that separates them. This is one that has been really barely known in Illinois. You know, there are very few collections up until the last 10 years or 20 years. It's really expanding its range, including in Chicagoland, but also in Southern Illinois. I've, in disturbed habitats, I find this plant, you know, some every year. Like, like I said, it's not rare enough where I need to think, oh, I've seen it. I have to go to this site to see it. I'll chance encounter it just in my normal explorations. Um, the Spiranthes ovalis. Definitely expanding in its range. <clears throat> and then the Spiranthes uh, rhizo, I can't see the name again, I forget it, rhizomafiana, something like that. Anyway, extirpated, it's far, common farther to the north, one that used to be here in Illinois, uh, no longer any population. So you have to go to the north and to the east, really, mainly for that one, although apparently it's out in the west as well, but no longer in Illinois. Then we have Spiranthes tuberosa. A lot of spiranthes. This is the little lady's tresses. Uh, and as the tuberosa name implies, it has a big tuber 
uh, at the base. Now you'd have to kind of dig up the plant to look to see the tuber. So definitely don't want to do that. Um, but they have tiny little flowers. And so I think they're distinct in that nature. And they like dry, shallow soil habitats like glades and sandstone barrens and things. But you see the range there just in extreme southern Illinois for that one. And then the last um, spiranthes here is Vernalis, the spring ladies' tresses orchid. Also very spiraling in nature with a single spiral of flowers. This is Illinois endangered species. Again, one that I'm tracking all known extant populations for. We have 16 subpopulations in five counties, I think, with several hundred individuals at some of them. So I'm not convinced it's uh, actually endangered, but it's one that we may revisit, but it's the earliest blooming spiranthes of the whole group. So we'll continue monitoring those and see if we find out more about them. But they are mostly in the in the southern part of the state, but uh, one that is also uh, moving north. So it's, uh, there are new county records we've had for that particular one. All right, just a few more slides. Lastly, it's kind of somewhat the best for the last. So uh, I mentioned that there were only two native orchids that are extant in Illinois that I've never seen that I the the Coloriza viridi and the um or the uh, Coeloglossum viridi and the Coloriza maculata well since they split out uh several new spiranthes species from the Cernua complex there are two that occur in Illinois that I have not seen in photograph because this is fairly recent taxonomic work so we also have in Illinois spiranthes okorluca and Spiranthes Shiviacii. Of course, Charles Shiviac here did the Orchidaceae of Illinois, so he got a species named in his honor uh, by the work there. And again, these are really um, minor morphological differences to tell them apart. So I'm putting up this video that I watched uh, earlier this year that was excellent. Uh, Matthew Pace, PhD, did a lot of uh, work on the Spiranthes of North America, and he, you know, proposed these new species and explains them in this video. So if you want to learn more about Spiranthes in Illinois, uh, go to the Native Orchid Conference uh, website and look at their their lectures and find the one by Matthew Pace that you see was, uh, he did last October. So he described several new ones, two of which um, are determined to occur in Illinois based on herbarium specimens. So these will probably go on the watch list so they can be tracked and we can try to learn more about their distribution in Illinois. Then this really exciting thing, uh, a friend of mine, the district forester in Southern Illinois, Jenny Lesko, was doing a um, forest management plan review on a private pine stand in Pope County and came across this orchid in full bloom. It had not previously been recorded in Illinois, and it's Neodia bifolia, the southern twayblade orchid. Really neat looking thing. It used to be in the genus Listera, which there are a number of you know species that are related to this, but they're all southern things. So it was found in Missouri in the last decade, and so in that respect, maybe not too surprising to see it in Illinois. Um, it could be moving north. Like we said, dust-like seeds, they, they move around. Uh, it's hard to explain how this showed up if it's always been there. Probably not because it's privately owned pine plantation. So sometimes the pines were planted there. Maybe there was seeds that came in with the pine. It's unclear. But in any event, it is naturally occurring, presumably native, very rare orchid new to the Illinois flora. So really exciting last June that um, that was discovered. So uh, just two more here then. We have Tipularia discolor. I mentioned with the uh, with the Aplectrum at the beginning, the crane fly orchid. You see the, the flowers look sort of like crane flies, which I added a photo of. So you can see the resemblance there. And it photosynthesizes in the winter. It blooms in early August, late July. So in the middle of the summer, it's really hot. And they're they're like translucent, yellowish, cream color. They're not very showy. They're, they blend in really well. They're impossible to photograph. Uh, but that is the cream fly orchid. And we see the distribution there. It wasn't even recorded from Illinois until I think the 1960s uh, when it was first found in the state. And it has been rapidly advancing northward. Um, I, we have a number of county records. You can go on almost any oak hickory, you know, dry mesic upland forest in southern Illinois and find leaves for the Tipularia orchid. So one that is expanding. 
And then lastly here, Trifora trianthophora, which is the three birds orchid, which is also statewide, but hard to find very ephemeral in nature. They, they have little, they're small plants. They don't have a lot of leaves. Um, they do what a mass, they kind of hang out in, in bud until the conditions are right. And often they kind of all bloom together and the flowers only last a single day. So very ephemeral. So I've found that, um, and actually Jim Fowler, who I mentioned earlier on his website, he talks about what he has determined to be the specifics about the timing of the blooms. And essentially it is, uh, you need in the heat of the summer where it's just hot and humid day after day, when you get two consecutive days where the nighttime low is 10 degrees or more lower than the previous day, you go out on the second day or the, the third day after two nights of that, and that's when they bloom all the same one. So, so basically any, any cooling off period in the middle of the summer in late July or in August um, are when these bloom. And I have two sites, one in particular, where I've counted thousands and thousands of these. Um, and, and as you can see in the picture on the right, often uh, all blooming at once. So I don't have a satisfactory photo of the mass bloom, really, but it gives you an idea of how they are so clumpy. But you can see the flowers up close. I think those photos are, are decent. I'll go to the next page here. You can see more of a, a clump of them blooming together. Um, again, each flower only lasts a single day. And as you can see, the dime there in my hand, they can be somewhat small, and tiny. Uh, some of them really occur. But I found that they, the, the site where they're really common, they're almost always associated with rotting a wood. So you find a, a tree trunk, an old tree trunk that's down, and it's almost fully decomposed. And around the base, or even coming out of it sometimes, um, are these orchids. So that's really a fascinating thing about these because they're not easy to find, uh, even though, as the map shows, and it's statewide. I mean, not in every county. It's, it's a forest thing. So in the middle of the prairie and open land, you're not going to find them. But in the in the mesic, you know, ravines and shaded forest areas of Illinois, you can still see that species. Okay, wow. There's been a, a rundown of all the orchids that once occurred in Illinois. Um, I wanted to mention uh, two other ones that I didn't cover that were also uh, listed somewhere as potentially occurring in the state that I think are erroneous. I forget all the particulars, but I wanted to be thorough in my examination of orchids uh, in Illinois. So those are two other ones that you can be aware of. Um, so with that, I would be happy to conclude the slideshow and answer any questions. And again, check out my YouTube channel and my website there's my email there. If you wanted to correspond with me, I welcome that as well. So I'll exit out here and answer any questions. Okay. There. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Uh, there were a few questions that came in in the chat. Uh, the first one was from Casey, who's uh, wondering that uh, pollinators are often attracted by the, the uh, colorful flowers. Uh, and yet the uh, the one uh, long bracted orchid that you showed early on, not much of a flower there, not much to see. Do you know what pollinates it? Well, I'm not sure offhand, but a lot of orchids are pollinated at night and they're pollinated by moths. So in that case, it may not matter what the color is. Also, you know, Insects see color differently than humans, but they are attracted by color. Um, and so I think it's interesting proposition that there may be differences under UV light. That's a great suggestion that I, I don't know anything about. Um, so I will just uh, mention that uh, a lot of orchids are, are pollinated at night by moths. Uh, Maureen uh, is wondering if you have any ideas about uh, the effects of climate change on orchids, either the, the change in varieties or the number of populations or the locations of the populations? You said well, a number of them were moving northward. Is that because it's getting warmer? Well, I mean, I don't know. I haven't read any scientific studies assessing that, you know, um, objectively, but that that is the thought that uh, the because it's occurring in habitats that aren't seeing any change and their common habitats, you would think that if they always liked it there, they would always have been there. 
And we know for sure that they are occurring in places that they didn't used to be. So it, obviously correlation is not causation, but it seems like there's strong indication that there, there are orchids that are moving north with climate change. And, and in Illinois, you know, the northern part of Illinois is, is like northern North America and the southern part is like the southeast. So we really have that gradient of, of um, temperatures and, and climate, basically, that, that I think would allow for them to move. So in the southern part of the state, you know, things are moving north that may have may have been just farther to the south. Um, but again, I don't have any quantifiable uh, data to, to reference. Um, Chris, I don't know if you could uh, look in the chat. This next question is rather lengthy. It's asked about the micro how do you say that? Microcorrhizal. <laughs> Myco Mycorrhizal. Uh, that uh, uh, one individual had uh, some spiranthes growing on his property for several years, but it's been gone now for several years. Uh, do you think the Mycorrhiza is gone, or do you think it's maybe still there and he's hope for a, a show of the return of the orchid? So the spiranthes are notoriously picky. I mean, the orchids in general are, um, like I said, they, even though they're perennial, they don't always show up in the same years. And some years may show up and then disappear. And you think, well, why was it just there once? Spiranthes do that a lot too. It seems like they often like um, disturbed areas, grasslands that are mowed. Often they come up in the areas, the paths that are mowed through these sites. So that's kind of interesting habitat choice for them. But then they show up one year and not the next. And, and so we have a number of sites where we reliably find them every year. We have a number of sites where they've been seen once and not seen again. So it's unclear to me why that is happening. I would think that the it's not an issue with the mycorrhizal and there's something else going on. But to be honest with you, I, I'm really not sure. I'll just say that it's common that spiranthes will show up and disappear. Um, he had a follow-up question uh, wondering if uh, other orchids would use the same mycorrhiza and might work in that location. So that's a great question. And I think the mycorrhiza is um, fairly specific to specific species. And what's interesting about that, and I, and I would encourage you to look into um, Dr. Lawrence Zettler is at Illinois College and he is doing worldwide research with orchids where he is actually isolating the, the fungi that is responsible for germination of sp particular species. And so he's been able to isolate these fungi and I think even in some cases describe them you know, to science. So I think they're somewhat specific, um, but I would, I would uh, suggest you look up the work that Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence Zettler is doing uh, at Illinois College. Uh, I had a question about the mycorrhiza uh, myself. Uh, we had a, a, speak, a soil scientist speak to us a number of years ago at one of our meetings, and he talked about it a little bit. And it's it's been 20 years since that happened. And uh, I think he said that it that this they are affected by pollution uh, and um, uh, disturbances in the atmosphere, and his his feeling was that they are declining. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, most things are in decline. It wouldn't be surprising, I suppose. I, I, I hadn't heard that. That's, that's, that's interesting. I know, you know, oak trees are very uh, dependent on mycorrhizal fungi for germination as well. So there's probably a lot going on under the soil that uh, we don't fully understand. Um, I had some random questions that, uh, I'll ask and uh, here, oh, here one uh, asked, uh, uh, are orchids, do they respond positively post fire? Most um, orchid species in Illinois occur in fire adapted communities that would likely burn somewhat regularly, you know, pre-settlement era. So, I and I know that a lot of times the orchids do respond favorably if it's a well-timed fire, meaning in the fully dormant season. 
there, you know, there's a number of things that fire is doing to the habitat um, that may not directly um, be associated with the specific plant, like they're opening up light or they're returning nutrients to the soil, they're reducing competition. So all those are happening that benefit orchids, but orchids are sensitive to disturbance generally, particularly some of the rare species. So I would, I would be, um, I'd want to use fire somewhat experimentally and make sure to, to understand the nuances. But generally speaking, most plants and habitats in Illinois have had frequent wildfire in the past and are adapted to deal with that. I did have a landowner tell me once that she allowed um, for a prescribed burn to happen in her woods where there was a number of orchids. I think it was the green, the, the green fringed orchid. And she said she never saw them again after that and, and was kind of uh, annoyed, I think, by the suggestion of prescribed fire, but I think generally that is a wise um, maintenance technique in, a, in most habitats. And again, these orchids, you know, it, it may not be directly um, attributable to uh, the fire that occurred as far as relating to why orchid might not be there, but generally speaking, fire should be beneficial for orchids and, and really most plants in, in Illinois. Uh how long, I was wondering, how long do the blooms usually last on the orchids? You, you said one uh, toward the end there just lasts a single day, uh, but it's, but there's many others that take its place, right? Uh, so you have a succession of blooms. How long could, can we expect the orchid to uh, bloom in the wild? I would expect on average, you know, generally speaking, about a week. And even within that week, you may be like the first day of that week, maybe a little bit before full bloom. And then, you know, many successive days of, of full glorious, you know, bloom and perfect condition. And then at the end of the week, sort of starting to wither away. So you do have to, to act quickly um, and go at the right time to see them in their full glory. Do, uh, do orchids bloom throughout the summer or is, is there a better time than others to, to go and hunt for them? So in Illinois, I would say June and July are the big months for orchids because I mentioned the Platanthera group. That's the summer, June, July, and there's a lot of species in that genus. So those are good months. But, you know, they really from from April, April until October or maybe even November. So the whole growing season really are some. The, the, some of the lady slippers can be in, in April. And then the, the ladies' tresses orchids still in the fall. So um, generally throughout the growing season, but I would say in the summer, mostly um, July, late June, early July. Uh, are there any orchids that are like ubiquitous that, that, that this species you could is easy to find or you can go almost anywhere to find it? Your maps pretty much had some in the north and some in the south and not much in the middle of Illinois. Uh, yeah, I would say the the Tway Blade, the um, um, Liparis liliifolia is the Tway Blade orchid. You can find that um, fairly easily. I mean, they're 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 not super showy, so you have to look carefully, but they like disturbed areas. I think you could find that statewide without too much looking, uh, but that's really the only one that really comes to mind. Maybe I mentioned the green fringe or the ragged fringed orchid, Platanthera lacera, also likes disturbance. So, you know, they move around with the dust-like seed in the wind. So, you, you know, if there's available habitat, they may occur, but those are two of the more common ones I think you could see statewide, but most of them are pretty restricted in their distribution. Yeah, we're in DuPage County and, and surrounding areas from DuPage County. Uh, do, do you have any forest preserves that you know of around here that are, are good for uh, locating orchids? I do, and um, I generally refrain from specifics about that where orchids occur. I would say that if people really want to see and photograph or observe these, that do some research and it wouldn't be too hard to figure out good places to go. But essentially, if there are nature preserves, Illinois nature preserves are high quality examples of various habitats. And so those are good places to look for orchids. Um, but they are very vulnerable for a number of things. And so tread lightly if you visit these areas. And obviously, as I mentioned, never dig them up. And, but even be, be careful not to trample them. We had a we had a site we were at this year that we found a new population and we went to show the steward and, and next thing we know there were three plants that were 
dead and on the ground that got trampled. So I made a, a collection for science out of them since they were, you know, cut off anyway. But, you know, we would want to be careful tramping around in these, uh, these pristine areas. Um, you said that deer eat orchids. Is that right? I do, particularly the lady slippers. You know, they like flowers. Or is they're very um, showy, so they're easy to see, I presume. But yeah, we often have, you can see uh, browsed stems on the lady slippers. Um, question came in uh, in the chat. Given the, the number of seeds that are produced by the orchids, uh, this individual says, in his experience, there's only a small area where you find them, where you see them. There's only, uh, there are very few growing there. And you would think that with that many seeds, they would be all over the place. You would, and, and that's true for, for all orchids. They have, they produce, you know, copious amounts of seed, but they have to land in a place where they can make that mycorrhizal soil attachment. And so that is uh, presumably the limiting factor that, you know, they're around Illinois widespread sort of generally speaking, but it's specific in these places. And so they, um, you know, I guess they're relying on on wind and fate to in order to land somewhere where um, this, this uh, association can be made with the soil fungi. And I'm not sure how close it needs to be that, you know, it's a tiny, tiny little speck of dust like the seed. And so... You know, as you can imagine, that landing in an area that has the necessary requirements for it could be a, 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 a tall bill to fill. So that presumably explains um, the rarity. Maybe that's why the plant has to shoot out so many seeds because so few land where that they're viable. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that uh, we're done here. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we had uh, a good turnout tonight, and uh, I'd like to remind people to watch their e-news in the future, and uh, you'll find out about more of Greater DuPage Wild Ones events. So I think we can sign off now. Thank you all for coming.